I'm Dr. Ashley DeLeon. I'm one of the surgeons uh, at our Austin location. And today we're gonna talk about the bilateral mastectomy with nipple alveolar complex reconstruction procedure, which is essentially the double incision chest masculinizing procedure. Um, the initial um, interaction is gonna be that we are going to uh, send you some intake forms and you're going to provide us with a medical history um, and that is going to be important in order to ensure your safety to undergo surgery and the best possible outcomes for you. Um, you'll fill out the form and return it to us. We'll review it and then we'll discuss it together. Uh, but essentially, you'll include your past medical history, um, which is important to let us know any past medical problems that you've had. So any medical di diagnosis that you've had or things that you take medications for. Um, it ensures that your heart and lungs are healthy uh, to undergo surgery, your kidneys are functioning properly, liver, etc. Um, some of the key things that we may hone in on um, will be like diabetes. Um, that's important because um, patients with either type 1 or type 2 diabetes um, have increased risks for infection, wound healing complications, um, perioperative complications, um, and it's also important so we can manage your blood sugars appropriately throughout the surgical process. Um, obesity is another one, um, which is a body mass index or BMI uh, over 35. Um, that's important because um, again, this can also cause increased complications, wound healing problems, um, infection risk. Um, it also leads to increased operative times as well as recoveries and increased risk for blood clots and post-operative pneumonia. Um, HIV is important to know about um, so that we can check the appropriate labs preoperatively such as your CD4 count and viral load um, to ensure that you're going to heal from surgery properly and that it's safe to operate on you. Um, bleeding disorders are very important um, as you can imagine since we're performing surgery um, as well as uh, blood clotting disorders um, that you may have or have been diagnosed with. Um, we'll want to know about your past surgical history, if you've had any other surgeries in the past. Um, it's helpful to know, um, to know how you respond to general anesthesia and also to see how you scar. Um, we'll ask about what medications you're taking. Um, if you're taking any blood thinners, um, that's medications um, such as aspirin, Plavix, Xarelto, Coumadin, um, Eliquis, Pradaxa, um, all of these medications thin your blood and make it very difficult um, for us to stop bleeding um, intraoperatively. So we may ask that you stop those medications for a period of time around surgery, depending on the reason you're taking the medication in the first place, as well as um, you know, which medication you're taking. Um, if you're taking any medications that impair wound healing, such as steroids, that's important to know about as well. Um, we will ask you about allergies. Um, it's important, obviously, to know any drug allergies as well as allergies to latex because that's utilized a lot um, during the surgical process in the operating room. And then um, <clears throat> we'll want to know about your social history, um, which includes kind of tobacco, alcohol, and drug use. Um, most importantly, we want to know about your nicotine use. Um, we will require that you abstain from all nicotine containing products for a month before and a month after surgery. And that is because nicotine is a very potent vasoconstrictor, uh, which means it clamps down your blood vessels. If your blood vessels are clamped down, you can't get enough blood flow and thus oxygen to the wounds in order to heal them properly. Um, so it significantly impairs your wound healing and your ability to recover from surgery and have a good um, and healthy cosmetic result um, after the operation. Um, and when I say nicotine products, I mean uh, not just cigarette smoke or chewing tobacco, but also vape pens, uh, nicotine patches, Nicorette gum, lozenges, etc. And we'll also ask you about family history. Um, we will definitely want to know about any bleeding disorders that run in the family since they tend to be hereditary and can complicate surgery, um, as well as problems with anesthesia that run in the family, such as malignant hyperthermia. And then also for this particular operation, if you have any significant family history of breast cancer, um, that's important information for us to know so that we can plan appropriately. Um, <clears throat> once we've done all this um, and kind of went through your entire medical history and discussed things, um, we will then reach out for insurance authorization if we're planning to use insurance and we follow WPATH guidelines. And for this operation in particular, um, we will just need one letter uh, from a mental health provider um, that is in support of the surgery um, for you. 
Um, once that's achieved, we'll be able to look at surgery dates. And once we're able to obtain a surgery date, um, we will send you a packet, a surgical packet, um, which will include all of your preoperative and postoperative care instructions, as well as the date and location of your surgery and the uh, date of your postoperative visit. Um, <clears throat> The day of surgery, uh, you'll come first for a preoperative visit to meet with me or us or whichever surgeon you're um, having surgery with. Um, <clears throat> and this is important so that we can do a physical exam and uh, fill out any hospital paperwork and consent forms and make sure you have any of your uh, questions answered uh, prior to surgery. Um, the day of surgery, we typically um, have you come in to the facility about two hours before the time of surgery. And this is so you can get into your surgical gown, have IV started, you can meet with anesthesia, um, the rest of the OR team, and then of course you'll see me or whichever surgeon you've uh, scheduled surgery with um, uh, approximately 30 minutes before your surgery time. And at this point, uh, we will do all your markings uh, for surgery. Um, as well as give you an opportunity to ask any last minute questions. Um, once we're in the operating room, um, it takes about um, an hour and a half to three hours um, to do this operation. And essentially during the operation, uh, we will be uh, doing a lot of measurements and markings once you're asleep. Um, and then we will be, it's a general anesthesia of course, and then we will be um, <clears throat> making the inframammary incisions. Um, which ultimately end up being the scars that you see um, on our website, on our results page. Um, and then we will be uh, removing the nipple areolar complex completely off your body. Um, we'll be reshaping it, resizing it, and thinning it and setting it aside for use at the end of the operation. Um, and then we will remove all the breast tissue as well as any excess skin and soft tissue um, all together and then closing down um, that space back to create those inframammary scars and kind of tack down that space so that you don't have fluid accumulation. Uh, once this is done, we sit you up in the operating room while you're still asleep and we use anatomic markers in order to determine the new placement of your nipple and areolar complex grafts. Um, once we've determined that, we lay you back down and then we place the nipple grafts um, within those uh, chosen positions. We suture them in place and then we suture bolster dressings in place, which our patients typically call nipple pillows or nipple muffins. Um, once those are on, then we place uh, stary strips, which are long pieces of tape along the inframammary incisions or the scars that you see. Um, and all the sutures for those incisions are under the skin and dissolve over time. Um, and then we place a bunch of fluffy stuff um, in between and then an abdominal binder um, around your chest. We don't use any drains um, for this operation. Um, and then you go strictly after that to the recovery room. And once you're in the recovery room, it's about an hour, hour and a half just for you to wake up, make sure your pain's controlled, that you're tolerating liquids, and then you're able to go home um, or to your hotel or Airbnb if you're from out of town. Um, <clears throat> for the next few days, um, we don't want you messing with the binder. Um, unfortunately, you won't be able to shower, but you can do sponge baths or wash your hair in the sink. Um, but the binder will need to stay in place and we just want you to leave everything alone, make sure your pain's controlled and just relax. Um, you'll come back for your post-operative visit that'll be scheduled beforehand. Um, that'll be somewhere between four to seven days after your surgery date. Um, at that post-operative visit, we'll take off the binder and you won't need to use that anymore. Um, we'll also take off the bolster dressings from the nipple grafts and all the sutures will come out from around the nipple areolar complex. Um, the inframammary incisions, again, those will have the stereo strips on, which will stay on for about two weeks typically before they start to fall off on their own. And again, there's no sutures to remove because they're all under the skin and dissolve over time. Um, once all the sutures are out, out from around the nipples, um, we will show you at that preoperative visit how to care for them moving forward, um, which is basically just bacitracin and, and large band-aids um, and to avoid shear force um, or like a rubbing motion um, or anything sticky or tacky on the nipples um, since the only thing holding the grafts on from that point moving forward um, is your own you know body growing blood vessel and sent the nerves back into the graft. Um, <clears throat> after that visit uh, we typically like to check in with you at 3, 6, and 12 months um, via email or phone to make sure that you're healing well, um, but um, you're able to return home if you live out of town um, after that initial post-operative visit. 
Um, activity wise, we don't want you doing any heavy lifting, so nothing over 20 pounds for four weeks after surgery. And in addition, we don't want you lifting, uh, I'm sorry, we don't want you reaching up over your head. So um, you don't have to have raptor arms, but you can come up to where your arm is parallel to the floor and you created a 90 degree angle between your arm and your body. Um, but we don't want you reaching up any higher above that. And that's because it puts unnecessary stress on the incisions. And anytime you put stress on the incisions, it causes your body to scar wider. Um, so things to just keep in mind when you're planning for your surgery. Um, those are the only activities restrictions we have. And again, that's for about four weeks. Um, after that first post-operative visit, um, you will be able to begin showering. Um, when you shower, however, we do not want the direct water stream hitting the nipple alveolar complex grafts. Um, and so it's easiest to turn your back to the shower and let the water run over your shoulders and have some, you know, soap from the, the loofah or, or washcloth, um, you know, kind of suds up to let the warm soapy water just run over your chest. Um, and then kind of pat everything dry with a towel, and then you'll be able to put the bacitracin and band-aids back on the nipple grafts before you get dressed once you get out of the shower. Um, you will not be able to submerge your chest in water of any kind for four weeks or until you're completely healed, um, and that um, includes baths, hot tubs, pools, lakes, rivers, etc. cetera, so um, just something to keep in mind. Um, Overall, um, patients do well with this operation, um, but no operation is without risks. Um, so the complications specific to this operation that we see um, are bleeding, uh, and bleeding um, can occur even into the binder, uh, which can be troublesome for patients because um, you can see it on the outside edge of the binder. Um, and, and that's okay as long as um, there's not a collection of blood that's underneath the flap that we created on the chest. Um, that bleeding, most of the time, we have to do absolutely nothing with. It resolves on its own and doesn't create any problems. Um, bleeding that causes what we call hematoma, um, which is a basically a big collection of clotted blood um, that can develop underneath um, one of the flaps on the chest. Um, that is, uh, it's not a subtle finding, um, it's pretty obvious. Um, it'll look like a big blueberry on your chest. It'll be extremely, exquisitely painful, and it'll be very different than the opposite side to where you can literally just barely lift your binder and see the difference between both sides. Um, that's bleeding that needs to be dealt with, um, and we do that by taking you back to the operating room and evacuating that clot and kind of, you know, suturing everything back together uh, so that you still heal very nice and have a good cosmetic result. And that typically, that type of bleeding usually occurs within the first 24 hours from surgery and happens in only about 2% of patients. Um, infection is another complication you can have um, with the uh, top surgery, and it's uh, less than 1%. Um, the chest is very vascular. It's pretty hard to get infected. Um, and uh, if, if so, if it was a skin infection or cellulitis where you have redness of the skin, um, that would be treated with antibiotics. If you developed an abscess, which is a collection of pus under the skin, that would be require something that needed to be drained in the operating room and then wound care afterwards. Um, however, this is exceedingly uncommon uh, with this operation. I have yet to see it. Um, but it can occur, and so you have to know about it. Um, wound healing complications um, or dehiscence, which means a separation of the suture line, um, can occur typically if these occur. Again, not very common, but if they do, um, it's typically something very superficial that heals in from the ground up over time on its own and uh, doesn't really change uh, your result or um, you know, cosmesis. Um, you can also have scarring, um, and again, no surgery is without scars, um, and you will have scars, and the inframammary incisions are what create those scars that you see online um, in all of our post-operative photos. Um, you can have unesthetic scarring, however, um, or asymmetric scarring, where one side's different than the other, um, and you can also have some contour irregularities uh, between both sides. Um, should any of those occur, it does take about nine months to a year before you see the final cosmetic result of the operation um, to give enough time for the collagen to turn over in the wound bed and the scar to mature. Um, but at that time, um, should you still have something uh, bothersome, um, then we do 
uh, revisions for these, um, you know, probably about 5% of cases uh, want some sort of cosmetic revision uh, for, uh, for scarring and, uh, or, you know, contrary irregularities. And most of the time when I notice that, it's usually under the arm. Um, they just want some excess tissue removed. Um, as far as sensation, um, sensation has a different priority for everybody, um, but if nipple sensation is important to you, um, remember we are taking the nipple completely off the body, thinning it and putting it on in a new spot. So all the nerves are severed and we are relying on your body to ingrow new nerves into the nipple graft um, in the new position on your body that we place it. Um, everybody does that to a varying degree, and we have no way to tell or determine um, how that's going to go. So about 80% of our patients overall um, have less sensation than they did preoperatively. 10% um, of our patients get back nothing, and cosmetically everything looks great, uh, but, but they have no sensation in their nipple any longer. And then about 10% of patients... Um, get back the exact same sensation that they had preoperatively. Um, the nipple graft, because it's a graft, it's coming off the body and being put back on in a new spot. And as I mentioned, you're relying on your body to grow blood vessels and provide it with blood and oxygen and nerves and all that. Um, there is a risk of losing the graft. There's about a two to 3% risk of partial loss of the graft, which means typically like a wedge shaped area or like a small area uh, will kind of necrose and slough off. Um, if that happens the vast majority of the time, um, everything can heal in from the ground up just fine and it doesn't, we don't have to necessarily do anything and cosmetically things turn out okay. Um, there is a 1% risk though of losing the entire nipple graft. Um, and we'll typically know that um, during the first post-op visit uh, when we take off the bolster dressing and the sutures. Um, the nipple graft, if, if we were to lose the entire graft, if it were to die off and not take for whatever reason, um, then once the nipple is gone, it's gone. Um, that being said, um, you know, with uh, the new medical tattoo um, artists we have these days, um, they do a fantastic job um, for creating nipples for us and symmetry. Um, if that were to happen, you know, that would be the option. Um, and then sometimes we could, uh, you know, carve a little bit of silicone off a silicone block and uh, lift it up and give you some actual 3D projection uh, to go along with the pigmentation from the medical tattoo artist uh, so that you can have symmetry uh, between both sides um, and feel good about your result um, if that were to happen. Um, again, that's a very rare complication. Um, it's around 1% in our country. Uh, it's never happened within our practice, but it can happen and so you have to know about it. Um, in addition to all of these risks, of course, there is risks just related to general anesthesia, um, and those will be gone through with you, of course, in detail uh, with the anesthesiologist and everything um, at the time of surgery. Um, and uh, most importantly, this is a, um, you know, it's a big operation, it's an important operation. So if you have any um, additional questions, uh, be sure to ask them and talk to your surgeon, uh, whether that be me or anybody else in our practice.